Well, how are we doing, Porch? Come on, let's go. Hey, we are so glad that you are here tonight at the Porch. My name is Josiah Jones. I have the privilege of being on staff here leading our 200 leaders that uh, make up this Tuesday night gathering that we call the Porch. Can we just give up a round welcome for our leaders? Yeah, come on. The ones that are in the parking lot sweating, although we got a cold front, praise God, right? Uh, those that are in the town center greeting you and those that are ushering you to your seat, even in this moment, man, we are so grateful for the leaders that serve here at the porch. Well, hey, we want to welcome you. You could be anywhere on a Tuesday night, especially if this is your first time. Thank you for choosing to be right here with us at the porch. It's a real honor. And we know you could be in a lot of different places. I want to give a shout out to our Porch Live locations, watching online, Porch Live Boise, Idaho, uh, Scottsdale, Arizona, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Midland, Texas, and a whole horse, host of others. Will you give it up for our Porch Live locations? Uh, tonight is a really special night because you're going to get to hear from a friend of ours at the porch. He, his name is Luke Lefevre. And uh, Luke is a, a friend, like I just said, of the porch. He's with his wife, Rebecca, tonight. And uh, here's what you need to know about Luke and Rebecca. Uh, Luke's 26 years old, lives in Nashville, Tennessee. Anybody from Nashville in the room tonight? Okay, a few of us. And, uh, and they have a daughter, Evelyn, who's one and a half. And man, they are here tonight because I believe that Luke has a call on his life for this generation. Uh, he leads a young adult movement called Consecrate. And uh, God is using his voice all across the nation. I would even go as far to say all across the world to call this generation to radical holiness, uh, to deep devotion to Jesus and his call and audacious faith. And I believe he has a message tonight for us here on a Tuesday in September that's going to call us to, to take next steps in our faith. So before Luke comes up and gives the message, I want to pray. And here's what I'm going to ask you. I'm going to invite you to pray with me. And uh, I'm going to ask you first to pray for yourself as you um, ask the Lord, wherever you are in your faith, or if this is your first time or your 50th time, that you would just say, God, I'm available for the next 30 minutes. I just want to hear from you. And so would you take the next 30 seconds just to pray and say, Lord, I'm available and I want to hear from you. And help me to not have any distractions so I can be laser focused on what your word has to say tonight. Take 30 seconds and pray for that. Then I'm going to ask that you would pray for Luke as he gets ready to come up here opens up God's word, that you would just ask the Lord to give him his words, that every word that comes out of Luke's mouth would be words from God, and that he would give him boldness and courage to proclaim what he has laid on Luke's heart. God in heaven, thank you for this night, a Tuesday in September 2023, that you have uh, destined us to be at tonight. There is no uh, chance that just people are here uh, randomly. God, but you have divinely put them in this seat in Dallas, Texas, and all across the nation to hear a message from Luke Lefevre. And I pray, God, that you would use him mightily, that his words would be your words. And God, that you would remove any distraction in this place. And that we would grab on to everything that you would want us to grab on to tonight. And we would walk out of these doors ready and available for any call that you would have on our life. And God, you would use him in a way where you get much, much glory as a result of him being here. And God, we would leave with a higher view of you and a lower view of ourself, and it would cause an incredible response in our life. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Y'all give it up for Luke Lefevre. Man, honored to be with you guys tonight. Like Josiah said, my name is Luke. I feel like we're just in a room of a few thousand of our closest friends. So 
you can consider me a friend because I, I want to talk to us just as, as a generation tonight because I believe that God, man, guys, do not let anybody tell you that God is not moving in our generation. God is moving in incredible ways across the earth right now. And I mean, I wish I could just take you in. Like, I don't have time tonight, but I wish I could take you in to just conversations, phone calls, meetings that I've had in the past two weeks alone. I am convinced that I think the next 10 years are going to be 10 of the greatest years of global revival that the world has ever seen. God, God is moving in that type of way in our generation. I think what God did at Asbury and, and things like he's been doing across the nation, I think that was just like the cloud the size of a man's hand. But I hear the sound like Elijah prayed, I hear the sound of a heavy rain coming on our generation, on our nation. And God wants to use us to do it. I mean, think about the miracle that is in this room right now. I mean, there's a few thousand of us in this room. So many of you watching online, some of you at the, the Porch Live locations, that there's this many young adults gathered together on a Tuesday night in the United States, hungry for God. That you came here because you're hungry for God. Like that, that doesn't just happen. That, that's a miracle of the grace of God. Like God is moving in our generation. And I grew up with a, a grandfather who was a pastor. And so I used to, he used to live around the corner from me and I would hop on my bike and I would ride over to my grandfather's house and he would tell me stories about revival. He would tell me stories about moves of God throughout history. And one of his favorite stories to tell was of this move of God that took place off the coast of Scotland on these small group of islands called the Hebrides. And on the Hebrides Islands, the church was dying. Like the, the, there were no young people in the churches. The church was dying out. It was basically at risk of completely disappearing. And there were these two elderly ladies that got together and they were in their like 70s, 80s and they began to cry out to God for revival on their islands. And they cried out to God and they cried out to God and they cried out to God and they started enlisting others to begin to cry out to God for revival. And then suddenly something broke open over the islands and they said it was like people became, the words that they used was God conscious. It was like, like heaven opened over the islands and there were people plowing in the fields and falling to their knees and giving their lives to Christ. And there were stories of 300 young people at a party and the presence of God hits the party. They run from the party to a church where services have been going till 11 o'clock at night. And the pastor comes out, sees 300 young people standing outside and they're going, hey, we don't even know why we're here. Something drew us to this place. Can you talk to us? And he shares the gospel. They all get saved. It was story after story after story like that. And the man who led that revival, his name was Duncan Campbell. And Duncan Campbell used to say this. He said, before God sets to empowering a people, he first sets to purifying a people. And he used to say this, he said, the crying need of our day, and this was in the 1950s, he said, the crying need of our day is a baptism of holiness, of holy living. And he said, at the, when that move of God was beginning to come to a close, he said, we began to understand that holiness and revival would always be interconnected. And so tonight, I think there's something, if we want to see a move of God in our generation, if we want to see, like, we're, we're hungry for God to move. Like, there's something in our generation that's just not common. Like, there is a sovereign thing that God is doing in our generation of a hunger for God, of a move for God. But if we want to see revival, we've got to lay hold of a hunger for holiness. Because at the end of the day, holiness isn't about being better than the person next to us or trying to do a bunch of good things. It's about a hunger for God himself. It's about a hunger for God. The Bible says in Hebrews, pursue holiness without which no man will see God. It is a hunger to run after holiness because we want to see God. And guys, tonight as I was praying into tonight, there were so many things that I, I wanted to talk about. Like I was like, man, could I take him into some of the things that are happening around the world right now? Could I take him into um, just some of the things that God has done in our generation to stir faith for what he wants to do? And as I prayed for you all, I was just been praying for you these past weeks. And I just kept hearing the verse in Matthew 24 that says, as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be when the son of man comes. As it was in the days of Noah, so will it be when the son of man comes. And that's in Matthew chapter 24. And if you want to turn there, starting in verse 37, that's where we're going to be. And as we get into this, I want to give us a working definition of holiness. Because I think there's a lot of confusion around what that is. And I'd say a pursuit of holiness is this. 
it is actively ridding from our lives anything that might hinder intimacy with Jesus. That's what it is. It is actively removing, cutting loose from our lives anything that might hinder intimacy with God. So if you're in Matthew 24, verse 37, we're gonna start there and it says this, but it says, but as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the son of man, Jesus, be when he returns. It says, for as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the son of man be. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming, but know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would, not, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore you also be ready for the son of man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So we need to ask the question, what, what was happening in the days of Noah? What was this overarching characteristic as it was in the days of Noah? So will it be at the return of Christ? Like what, what was happening in the days of Noah? And I think the overarching characteristic, like we know that story, right? Like I have a one and a half year old daughter. She has this little book about Noah and the animals, right? But what was this overarching characteristic of that generation? And I would say it was this, it was widespread complacency towards the wrath of God against sin. There was a flood coming and no one took it seriously. No one cared, no one paid attention. There's one guy building an ark and going, listen, I'm gonna live blamelessly before God. I'm gonna pursue righteousness. I'm gonna pursue holiness. An entire generation is going, God doesn't really care about the way that I'm living my life. And as I prayed for us tonight, I felt like there was a warning for us as a generation that we need to lay hold of, that I think there's a couple people that I'm talking to in the room tonight. And I think first, there's maybe a few of you in the room, hopefully there's a lot of you in the room that maybe you got invited here and you don't know Christ, or maybe you think you know Jesus, but you don't know what it actually means to surrender your life to Jesus. Maybe you just randomly found your way in here. Maybe a friend invited you after launch and you're here tonight and you have a date with the destiny of God for your life tonight that he brought you into this room because he has eternal plans and purposes for you, that he loves you and he wanted you to be here tonight to hear about the only thing that can change your life and that's Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody believes that. One person does. And then I think there's another group of us in the room that maybe you've surrendered your life to Christ. You've given your life to Christ. You have, you have been following Jesus, but that there are areas of compromise and unconfessed sin in your life you've been unwilling to give up. And Jesus is calling you to repentance and to turning tonight. And so what are the things in this passage, what do we need to know? And I think the first thing as, is this, as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be when the son of man comes. I think the first thing is this, is that we cannot mistake God's patience with us as his passivity towards our sin. God is so patient with us. He is so kind. He is so loving. He is so merciful. But I think there's a danger for us as a generation when we see the patience and the love and the kindness of God to assume that that also equals his passivity towards our sin. God's patience is not his passivity. Sin isn't cute. It's not a guilty pleasure. It's what crucified the son of God. Stop playing with it. Listen, we have become playful and made pets out of the things that crucified the man we claim to love. Something doesn't add up there. We get entertained by and consume the things. We watch the shows and listen to the music and say the things that put the son of God on the cross. The man we claim to love and follow and we champion it and we cheer for it. Something doesn't add up there. And God is calling us to change. Listen, it says until the day Noah entered the ark, they thought God had forgotten. And I think that's the case of some of us in the room. We're thinking either God doesn't see what I'm doing, God doesn't care what I'm doing, or at least he doesn't care enough for me to do anything about it. He doesn't care enough for me to change. 
But let me say this, God does not take lightly in the lives of his people that which killed his son. I have a, a, a guy that I've been discipling for the past couple of years and we were having a conversation the other day and uh, he's, uh, in, he's getting his degree in philosophy and he was in his philosophy class the other day and his professor uh, goes, hey, I wanna challenge you guys. He goes, take your religion, whatever religion you believe, whatever that God says is a sin, go do it, I dare you. Go do it, see if there's any wrath. See if there's any judgment. There won't be. And then do it again and see if anything happens. He goes, then you'll come to know that everything you believe is a lie. There was this famous message that was preached in the early 1700s by a man named Jonathan Edwards. And it was attributed to being one of the things that actually sparked one of the greatest revivals in American history. And I laugh because this message is getting a lot of bad rap online. Like people keep like posting about it and anybody who's giving it a bad rap probably hasn't actually read it, which makes me laugh. But when he preached this message, so many people started getting saved. And it was this message that was called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And it has a very deceiving title because it makes it feel like, oh, God is this angry person that just can't wait to get his hands on some sinners and crush them. And like, that's not at all what he's talking about. Because what he's talking about is this, is he is saying, he goes, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. And it also says that all have sinned. He goes, and there's so many people going around that's going, one day I'll stand before God and then he'll, he'll pronounce me guilty or not guilty for sin. He goes, that's not how it works. He goes, the pronouncement of guilty has already gone out over every man and woman who's ever lived. He goes, and God has no obligation to keep us from separation from him. And he goes, you know what the only thing is that is keeping us at any moment from separation from God for eternity? He goes, it is the loving hands of a gracious God giving us time to repent and turn. His patience in holding us in going, this thing is after your destruction. This thing you're entertaining in your life that is coming after you. He's going, I'm giving you time, but it is not, his patience is not his passivity. We serve a kind, gracious, merciful, unthinkably loving God. Let me say this quickly. You may have had, so much of our view of God is determined by our, the dad that we had. And some of you may have had an abusive, controlling father. And that is not who God is. But let me say this. He's also not the passive father who lets his kids do whatever they want, even though it's destroying them. Like I have a one and a half year old daughter and the hardest thing for me to do is to discipline her because I'm like, man, I want you to love me. I want you to like me. Like, I don't want you not to like me. Like I want to give you good things. I want to be kind to you. But as a dad, loving her is helping her see the things in her life that are destroying her. That's the kind of father that God is. We serve a loving God, but I think we can also easily forget that we serve the Jesus who the book of Revelation says his eyes are like flames of fire. That a two-edged sword comes out of his mouth. That the prophet Isaiah, when he saw God, the angels cry out, holy, holy, holy. We took my daughter to the zoo uh, like last week. And um, I was super excited to actually take her. I know that sounds, I was like, I probably was more excited about the zoo than she was. Um, but I was super excited because there was this new tiger exhibit that they built at our zoo and it's actually won a ton of awards. It's pretty cool. So we go and I'm like super excited. I'm like, please let the tiger like be there where we can actually see it. And we pull up and we've got our daughter in the stroller and the tiger is sitting like two feet from the glass. It's right there. My daughter wants to get out and see it. And so we take her out and she's like up on the glass, like banging on the glass, like two feet from this tiger. She is so close to this thing. And I was so excited to get there and to see it. But when I saw the tiger, I felt, I felt sad. I was like, this, this isn't how this relationship was supposed to be. Because the zookeeper is telling us, like, this thing is 250 pounds of pure muscle, 500 pounds per square inch bite. Like they feed it bone because it crushes bone with its teeth and can literally just swallow bone whole. And I'm sitting there and I'm going, this, this isn't how this relationship was supposed to be. This thing cooped up in an enclosure for people's entertainment. Like he's wild. 
He's dangerous and that's beautiful. And part of me looked at that tiger and thought like, I I want to have reverence for you. Like I wanna have a reverence for you. That's how this relationship is supposed to work. I shouldn't be standing this close. I shouldn't have my one and a half year old daughter like playing around a tiger. Like I should have come up on you in the wild where there's no glass enclosure for my entertainment. I'm coming up on you in your territory and I am terrified and in awe of the sight of you. And I give you honor and respect. And there is, that's what this relationship is supposed to be like. Listen, our God is described in scripture as a lion. And many of us are trying to put him in our cute little enclosure so that he's nice to look at, but no longer wild, no longer dangerous, no longer has wrath towards sin. I think there's this danger for us in our generations. Like we want to make Jesus into like this nice, like Middle Eastern Mr. Rogers. Like that's what we're trying to do. Look, I love Mr. Rogers. I think there's a ton of amazing Jesus-like qualities in Mr. Rogers, but he's also the lion of the tribe of Judah. And it's time we start treating and remembering him as such. There's this temptation for us to shave the mane off the lion of Judah and try to take his teeth out and put him in an enclosure that we just come to for our entertainment or when we want something. Listen, you can't tame God. God will not be tamed by us. He will not be put in our cute little enclosure for our entertainment. He is sovereign. He is holy. He is the I am who I am. And nobody approaches a lion in the wild casually. We have lost our reverence for God as a generation. We need our reverence back. We need our holiness back. We need our fear of God back. In the words of R.C. Sproul, a God who is only love only grace, only mercy, no sovereignty, no justice, no holiness, no wrath is an idol. It is something we've made in our own image to try to make God like us. I think one of my favorite descriptions of Christ actually comes from C.S. Lewis's book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And that story, there's four children and they're going to meet uh, this lion named Aslan, who's a depiction of Christ. And they're going to meet him for the first time. And one of the oldest, the, one of the oldest children named Susan, she finds out for the first time that he's not a man, he's actually a lion. And she goes, wait, wait, wait. She goes, he's a lion? I thought he was a man. And she goes, is he safe? And their guide who is getting ready to take them to see Aslan looks at her and goes, he's a lion. Of course he's not safe but he's good. That's our God. He is good. He is loving. He is merciful, but he is not this Middle Eastern Mr. Rogers that we've tried to make him into. He is bold and powerful as a lion. We cannot mistake God's patience with us as his passivity towards our sin. But there's something that I think we need to grasp here because I think we can get this twisted in our minds. And the second thing we need to know is this, is that Jesus, at the end of the day, he's not as preoccupied and focused on your sin as he is on your sanctification. We think Jesus, like we can get this idea that Jesus, that the Father, that they're just sitting up in heaven nitpicking at our sins. He's not. He's passionate about your holiness. He's not sitting up there going, man, one, two, there's another one, there's another one. He's going, I'm passionate about you being everything that I've created you to be, about you living the fullness of life. I'll get into this a little bit later, but in John uh, chapter 16, Jesus has been telling his disciples to keep his commandments. And then he gets into John chapter 17 and he says, listen, he goes, I have told you these things so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be full. See, holiness is not this straitjacket that leads to dead, lifeless religion. It is actually one of the greatest keys to life-giving joy in Jesus. Jesus isn't as focused on your sin as he is on your sanctification. The only reason Jesus points out our sin and, and is calling us out of our sin is because he's trying to take us into a place of sanctification. Now, what is sanctification? Sanctification is growing in holiness and in Christ-likeness. It's learning to love what he loves to hate what he hates 
and to live how he lived. I once heard the story, whether it's true or not, um, it's up for debate, but I think the principle is powerful. Is there was a man who claimed that one night he was asleep in bed and he opened his eyes to an angel being right in front of his face. And he opened his eyes, he said, there's this angel literally right in his face. And he looked in the eyes of the angel and he goes, what are you looking for? And the angel looks into his eyes and he said, God is looking to see how much of his son he sees in you. The father isn't sitting up in heaven counting your sins going one, two, three, four. He's going, how much of my son do I see in you? Man, and I want the answer when God looks at me, when God looks at us to be a whole lot. Like I want God to be like, I see so much of my son in you. Perfect? No. Improving? Yes. I want God to look at my life and go, I see so much of my son in you. That the image of Jesus in me isn't marred and muddied and confused by sin and compromise in my life. I heard this song last week and I just haven't been able to get it out of my head. It's a song called I'm Not My Own by Sky Peterson. And she says in the verse, she says, my body is a temple of the living God. I will worship in this house that his blood has bought. As I bear his image, I love this. May I not profane the holiness I hold in this earthly frame. And then she goes on in the course to say, I am not, I belong to the Lord. I am not my own end of the day, Jesus is not as interested in your sin as he is in your sanctification. Why? Because nothing destroys intimacy with God and effectiveness for the kingdom of God faster than unconfessed, unrepentant sin. Listen, Jesus desires your holiness because he desires your joy. Jesus desires your holiness because he desires your joy. He is after our intimacy, our joy, and our effectiveness for the mission and the kingdom of God. If you would turn quickly to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 19 through 21. I'm going to go through this quickly. It says this, it says, let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity or sin. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. What is he saying there? Like when you go to like your grandma's house, like I don't know if your grandma was like mine, but she had like this fine china that was used for special occasions. He's going, there are things in a house that are used for special purposes. And he says, in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, things for special purposes, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, from dishonor, from sin, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Flee also youthful lusts, but pursue, chase after, run after righteousness." What is Paul saying in this this passage to Timothy? He's saying, listen, God wants to use all of us. But have you ever wondered like, why does God use certain people to send revival to nations? Why does God use some people to turn cities and, and, and history upside down and not use us? Is it just the random sovereignty of God? Paul says here, it's not. He says he uses those who have consecrated, who have set their lives apart to God. Does God use perfect people? No, because none of those exist except for Jesus. But purified people, yes. I think John Tyson, when he was commenting commentating on this passage, said it best. He said, listen, if you're not living a consecrated life, God won't love you any less, but he will use you less. The power of God flows unhindered through a holy life. In the words of E.M. Bounds, who wrote a book called Power Through Prayer, he wrote in the 1800s, he led a move of God not far from where I live, one of the incredible moves of God of the past several hundred years. And he wrote this in his book, Power Through Prayer in the 1800s. He said, it is not great talents, nor great learning, nor great preachers that God needs. Like, 
what's like not claiming I'm a great preacher. I'm saying like God doesn't need just more preachers. He doesn't need more people to talk into a microphone. He says, but what God is looking for are people great in holiness, great in faith, great in love, great in fidelity, great for God. People always preaching by holy sermons in the pulpit and by holy lives out of it. Purity and power go hand in hand. If we would ask and we would look at our generation, we go, man, where's the power of God in our generation? Like, why isn't God moving here? Why isn't God moving there? Where is the power of God in our generation? I think a better question we should ask first is where is the purity of our generation? As I said, the Duncan Campbell quote at the beginning, before God sets to empowering a people, he first sets to purifying a people. Nothing destroys intimacy with God and effectiveness for the kingdom of God faster than unconfessed, unrepentant sin. And the next thing we need to know is this, is that obedience to God is not legalism. It is evidence of true love for God. See, in the Christian life, Jesus has told us that there is the narrow road that leads to life. He tells us in Matthew that it is a narrow road that leads to life. And I have a graphic, if we can throw it up here real quick. It is a narrow road that leads to life, that leads to not just eternal life, but human flourishing in this life. And the line that runs down the center of the road to life is loving obedience. And on either side of this road, you have two ditches from the pit of hell that are called legalism and lawlessness. Now, what are both of those? Legalism says, I can be as good as God. Lawlessness says, I know better than God. So legalism, perfect example in the scripture is the Pharisees. They're going, I don't need Jesus. I can earn my way to God by keeping laws. Listen, everyone has sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. There is nothing that you could do. Like growing up and even like, this is something in my own life that I battle with. And I go, Lord, like rid this from my heart. Like my temptation is to think, man, God had to save me, just not from that much. God had to save me, just not from that much. And it is like, we have fallen so far. Like we think we're not that bad because we live among, among a bunch of other really bad people. Like I think that I'm not that bad of a basketball player because I play with a bunch of really mediocre people. And then if I would go play LeBron one-on-one, I'd be like, I'm a horrible, horrible basketball player. Like when we compare ourselves with the glory of God, we realize how far from him we really are. And legalism says, I can be as good as God. But I think our temptation more so in our generation is going to be to fall into the ditch of lawlessness that says, I know better than God. That says, look, God, I know you say in your word that this thing isn't good for my life or that this displeases you or that I really shouldn't be walking in this, but I know better than you because I'm getting some fulfillment and some joy out of it. And I think it's gonna be all right. Like I'm just gonna keep walking in this because I like it. And I think I know better than you do. But God is looking at the long game. He's going, this is out for your destruction. And it's the twin ditches of legalism and lawlessness. But I think our temptation as a generation is going to be to lean towards lawlessness. And in Matthew 24, earlier in that chapter, in verse 12, it says this, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Love for Jesus grows cold in an atmosphere of lawlessness. We cannot say that we love God and yet have no desire to obey God. Those things are incongruent with the scriptures. We cannot say we love God and have no desire to obey God. What is lawlessness? It is this contempt for or violation of or disregard for the commands of God. And lawlessness in the end, you might be able to entertain a little bit of it now. Like you may be able to have a little bit of fire and a little bit of lawlessness in your life, but in the end, that thing is going to kill. It will smother the flame of fire and passion for Jesus in your life. It will take it out. And lawlessness is a fake liberty. It is counterfeit freedom. See, liberty and freedom in Jesus, this loving obedience to Jesus, liberty in Jesus is not the freedom to sin however we want, do whatever we want and still be covered by the grace of God. Liberty is the freedom to choose to obey God. Not simply out of obligation, but because we love him. 
It's liberty because it's no longer forced, but it's rather out of freedom. In John chapter 14, 15, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. The evidence of love for God is a desire to keep his commands. He says again in John 14, 21, he who has my commands and keeps them, it is he who loves me and he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. I will reveal myself to him. He says in 15, 10, he says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide and you will live in my love. Guys, I think if some of the people in our generation, like if some of us were around at the time Jesus was preaching that message in John chapter 14 and 15, I think some of us would be going up to him after service and be like, hey, Jesus, can I talk to you for a second? Can I pull your side for a second? Oh, I'm just going to tell you something. Um, great message. It was good. It was, it was pretty good. Um, but I don't know if you know this. I do, so that's what I'm telling you. Is um, all that like obedience to command stuff, it's kind of legalistic. Like, I don't, I don't know if you know that, but it's kind of it's leaning towards legalism. But he's just going, no, 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 no. He goes, I've told you these things so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be full. Listen, I think our generation, if we were back in the days of King Josiah in the Old Testament, I think maybe some of us would have said the same thing. Where Josiah becomes king at eight years old, his dad is an idiot and leads the entire nation of Israel into sin and corruption and is tearing the nation apart. Josiah becomes king at eight years old. And when he's a teenager, they uncover the word of God that his dad had buried a bunch, under a bunch of junk in the temple for decades. Like it had disappeared. Like the entire word of God to a generation had disappeared. He gets a hold of it. He reads it like in one sitting. Reads the Old Testament essentially. Not all of it because not all had been written by the point he was alive. But he reads the scriptures for the first time, sees how far they are from how God had called them to live. And he starts going from north to south in the kingdom of Israel and tearing down every single idol in all of Israel. And I think some of us would be going, listen, Josiah, whoa, whoa, calm down, bro. Like every idol, everyone, listen, okay, you can have the big ones. Take the big ones. Those are great. Like take those, but just let us keep our household gods. Like let us just keep the little ones. Okay, not the household gods. Let us at least keep the high places. And the high places in Israel weren't even necessarily places of worship to false gods. They were attempts to worship God how people wanted to worship God. They were altars to Yahweh built in a way that was not prescribed by the word of God. That they were going, I'm gonna worship God. I'm just gonna do it how I want. And no king in Israel's history had ever torn them down. They'd torn down the other idols. They'd taken the household idols down, but they'd never taken the high places down. And Josiah goes, no. He goes, no compromise. Not in my day. And listen, I think there are some of us, I think we are in danger of a generation of not even realizing how far we are from God because we haven't been in the book enough to know. Like Josiah uncovers the word of God that's been hidden for generations and he weeps and he's like, where was this? Nobody told me this. Nobody told me that God wanted to bless our nation, that he wanted to live among his people, that he wanted to dwell in our midst, that the manifest presence of God could be in our nation and in our lives and we could be a beacon of hope to the world. And this is what he tells us to live and we have completely squandered it and we have, we have completely neglected God. And look, if we will get into the word of God, it will expose the idols in our lives. And I think God is looking for a generation that is going no compromise. We want God. Listen, sacrificial obedience isn't legalism. It is evidence that there's nothing in your life that you love as much as nearness to God. You know, one of the other things that we learned when we were at that tiger exhibit, obviously you can tell, I really liked the tiger exhibit. Um, my wife actually pointed this out, so I'm gonna pretend like I came up with this. Um, but one of the other things that we learned at the tiger exhibit was they actually have three tigers at this one exhibit, but they'll only put one in the enclosure at a time. And so some people were asking the zookeeper who was standing there explaining, they're like, why do you guys only put one at a time in there? Like, will they fight? And he goes, no, no, they won't fight. And he goes, 
And at that point, he starts to explain to us the territorial nature of big cats, like tigers and lions. He goes, they won't fight. He goes, you would just never see them. He goes, because one would go to one corner of the enclosure and one would go to the other corner of the enclosure. Why? Because big cats don't share territory. The lion of Judah is not content to share the territory of our hearts with idols and unrepentant sin. He won't do it. He'll go, you want to live that way? It will smother your love and our intimacy. He's not going to share the territory of our hearts with idols. Sacrificial obedience is not legalism. It is evidence of true love for Jesus. And I want to say this lastly. We're talking about in the days of Noah, as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be when the Son of Man comes. I was meditating on that passage and I was just, as I was preparing for tonight and I was just thinking about that, I'm going, really, Lord, like one righteous man? One righteous man and his family were saved out of all of those people, really, God? And I just felt him just remind me. Yes, Luke, only one blameless man, as it said, of Noah. But Noah was a picture of the only one righteous, sinless man who would come to save the world of sin. And now, his family. See, Jesus is the ark that we run into in the flood of the wrath of God. And we say, Jesus, save us. It is a prophetic picture of going, there is displeasure of God against sin. We run in and we go, Jesus, only you can cleanse me. Only you can change me. I love what Charles Spurgeon once said. He said, you want to live a holy life? You must live near to Jesus. Like we can't live in holiness in our own strength. It is nearness to Jesus. It is the Holy Spirit empowering us to live how he has called us to live. Jesus is the ark that we run into in the midst of the flood. Listen, God's work on the cross through Jesus didn't simply erase the wrath of God against sin. Because I think we can think that. We're like, Jesus came and now poof, God no longer cares about sin anymore. That's not what happened. What Jesus did on the cross didn't erase God's wrath against sin any more than build, Noah building an ark erased the flood from coming. What Jesus did on the cross rescued us from God's wrath against sin. But I think there's this danger for us that I see in our generation of like, we don't see Noah when the flood comes and the ark is built and it's being lifted up on the flood waters that he's getting up on the deck and going, I wonder how close I can get to the railing without falling into the flood. Like, I wonder how close I can get. And then the, the rain starts to stop a little bit and the, the flood waters start coming from the springs of the deep as, as the word says was happening. And the water starts to calm a little bit and he goes, I'm just, you know what, I'm just gonna take a little quick dip in the flood. Like Shem, Japheth, like hop in bros, like the water's fine. Like, why don't you jump in with me? Let's take a swim around. Like, no, he's not going. How close to the line can I get without falling into dis the God's displeasure? And I think God is looking for a generation that's not going, how close to the line can I get without sinning? They're going, he's looking for a generation that's asking, how close to God can I get without holding anything back from him? Jesus isn't looking for a generation that's going, well, this is kind of a gray area, so I'm going to dive into it. We're not looking at gray areas and going, well, it's gray, so the Bible isn't really clear, so I'm just going to, I'm going to run for it. I'm going to jump into it. We're going, does this thing, we're not asking, is it sin? We're asking, does this thing actively draw me to Jesus? Does this actively draw me closer to God? Does this look like the pursuit of righteousness, the pursuit of holiness? And tonight, I think there's a couple responses for us. And if you want to go ahead and stand to your feet, I think there's a couple responses for us tonight. And like I said at the beginning, I think there's some of you in here that you don't know Jesus. Maybe you grew up in church. Maybe you, you, you thought you knew what it meant to follow Jesus. Maybe Christian was just a label that you used because you grew up in a Christian home. 
but you never heard that the wages of sin is death, that all have sinned, that what we are rightfully owed for the choices that we have made to rebel against God is separation from God for eternity but that God sent his son and that the gospel is this, that it's the good news that God became a man in Jesus Christ, that he lived the life that we couldn't live, that we've tried to live, but we couldn't, that we've all sinned. And then he died the death that we deserve for our sin in our place. And not only did he die the death we deserve, but three days later, he rose from the dead, proving he was who he claimed to be, the son of God, And now he offers the gift of salvation and forgiveness of sins to all who will repent and believe in him. And there's some of you here tonight who you need to make the decision to say, I'm going all in. I see that there is the wrath of God against sin, the flood coming, and I will not live in indifference towards it. I see the ark. Listen, if if you were living in the days of Noah and you could see the raindrops falling and the, the, the ark door was still open, wouldn't you run? Wouldn't you run to go, save me? I, I don't care what the stipulations are. I don't care what, what, what the, the qualifications need to be. And good news, the qualification is just this. Jesus, I have no qualifications. I need you. And I surrender everything in my life to you. Wouldn't you run? That's some of us in the room tonight. And then there's some of us in the room tonight that I think we need to pray as the psalmist prayed in Psalm 139. God, search me and know me and see if there is any wicked way or unpleasing way in me to you and lead me in the the way everlasting. God, is there anything that is hindering closeness with you? Like you've just been coming off of launch, talking about the love of God, the desire that he has to be near to his people, to, to live with you, to love you, to transform you. And hold the pursuit of holiness isn't about going, well, I gotta clean myself up to come to God. It's going, God, help me, I need you. Lord, I want to live close to you. Would you shine a spotlight on any area that's compromising that? in my life. Like, listen, even recently I've been praying. I was like, Lord, is there anything in my life? And I felt like he was just even highlighting a TV show that we had watched. And it was like super clean, except for a few pieces of this, like one part of it. And I felt like the Lord was like, listen, like nothing in your life that could compromise intimacy with me. How many of y'all have heard the verse, draw near to God and God will draw near to you? Have you heard that before? Did you know that that verse is actually in the context of repentance? We think, draw near to God in worship. Draw near to God in the word. Draw near to God in prayer. But it actually says in James chapter four, it says, cleanse your, cleanse your hands, clean your hands. Purify your, your hearts, you double-minded. Weep and mourn, draw near to God and God will draw near to you. You wanna know what the key to drawing near to God is? It's repentance. It's going, God, I turn from anything that hinders intimacy with you according to your word. And I am running into full surrender to you. And so we're gonna take a moment to respond to that in just a second. One thing I wanted to to do tonight is, I know we've been talking about holiness and there's so many practical pieces. There's so much misconception around holiness in our generation. So I recently wrote a book on this. It's actually super short. It's like 70 pages. I made it short on purpose. JP, Jonathan McClude actually wrote the main endorsement for it, but I wanted to give it to y'all. You guys can download it for free, actually. If you scan this QR code, you can download it for free. I just encourage you to read that, to go, hey, here are the the keys that God is, is calling us to walk into. And the subtitle of this book is Rediscovering the Joy of Holiness. That God desires our holiness because he desires our joy. So if you're looking for some like practical next steps, that's a great place to start. We wanna go ahead and with every head bowed, every eye closed. If you are here tonight and you feel the Holy Spirit drawing you to Jesus, you're going, man, I didn't know that my sin had separated me from God. I thought Jesus was just like this guru guy, like this nice guy to kind of pattern my life after. after. I didn't know that he was saving me from the righteous judgment of God against sin. And you're going tonight, is my night. I I am surrendering everything to Jesus. I'm putting my faith in Jesus. I am turning from the way I've been walking. I'm giving everything to Jesus. Just on the count of three, I want you to raise your hand and look up at me. If that's you and you feel your heart beating out of your chest, that's the Holy Spirit saying, that's you. One, two, three. 
Come on, praise God. Praise God, come on. Praise God, praise God. Come on, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, praise God. If you're at the porch live location, same thing. Just put up your hand, just this physical response of going, I'm surrendering everything to Jesus. Praise God. And then with every head bowed, every eye closed, if, if there is, if, if there are those of us in the room, we're praying, God, search me, know me. See if there is any wicked way in me. Lead me in your way everlasting. If there's anything unpleasing to you, shine a spotlight in my heart, Holy Spirit, because I want to be near to you. I want to draw near to you. I'm not gonna call for a response, but what I'm gonna do is we go back into worship. If that's you, there's gonna be a ministry team down here. And if there are things that you need to confess your sin, the Bible says to confess your sins to one another. To go, listen, I have been walking in this. This is the key to your freedom of confessing openly what you've been walking going, I'm gonna go to a leader. I'm gonna go to one of the porch team members. I'm gonna go, hey, this is something I've been struggling with. I've been walking in this. I am confessing this. I am turning from this. Would you pray with me? Because I'm running after Jesus. And I would encourage you to come down, find a team member, pray with them. And the Bible says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and he is just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us. Guys, there is nothing like the feeling of the fresh cleansing and washing of the Holy Spirit. When, you, when we come and we confess sin to God, he doesn't go, been waiting for you to tell me that. Should have done that a long time ago. He doesn't beat us up. He goes, man, I've been waiting to wash you. All that guilt you've been feeling, all that confusion you've been feeling, all of that grasping for something that you thought was gonna satisfy you, but didn't, I've been waiting to cleanse you. I've been waiting to wash you clean. Let Jesus do that for you tonight. And if you gave your life to Christ for the first time, I would encourage you to come down and pray with the porch team. We're also, actually, we're gonna do this really quickly. If you gave your life to Christ for the first time, we're gonna pray this together. And I wanna say this, this prayer does not save you. Putting your faith in Jesus does. What this prayer is, is just helping give you some words to say, I am giving my all to Jesus. And I would just encourage us to pray this together. So let's pray this, Lord Jesus, I know that I have sinned, that I have fallen short of your glory. I know that I need you. I know that I've been separated from you by my sin. And I ask that you would come into my life and change me from the inside out. I give you every part of my life, the big parts, the small parts, and everything in between. And I commit to seek you with my whole heart from this day forward. In Jesus' name.